Let's look a little at body fluids. This has been discussed in many chapters of the book, as far back as the first anatomy course, all the way through the second hormones, like uh, chapters like on the hormones and so on down the line. But look at this total content of water inside the body. Everybody knows that every living cell has to have a certain amount of water inside of it and a certain amount surrounding it. So when you look at the intracellular, what's on the inside, about 40% of our total body weight comes from the water that's found inside cells. That's a large percent of our body weight right there. Then if you look at this water in different areas and compartments that surrounds the cells, that's another 20. So it's about 60% of our body weight being water. And of course, this water has different names depending on where it's at. If you look in the tissue surrounding the cells, you'll see the interstitial, also called the extracellular fluid. The plasma, the watery part of the blood, it's a large amount of that. Lymph, the water found in the lymphatic vessels. Cerebrospinal fluid found inside the ventricles and in and around the brain and spinal cord. And synovial fluid found in many joints of the body. So there's lots of places we have water. There's some good abundant examples there. Looking at some of these abundant ions in the body. Remember, ions by definition are charged particles. We often talk about these when we talk about membrane potentials and action potentials. Those electric signals are generated by the movement of these ions, so they're vitally important to life. When you look at these abundant ions in the body, sodium and calcium are kept in the extracellular environment outside the cell membrane, and the majority of the potassium on the inside. Make sure abundant cations are those which have positive charges there. You look at the anions with negative charges, chloride's a very common one there. Wherever the sodium is at, it's where the chloride will be. Those opposing charges, they follow. That chloride follows that sodium. Since those chloride channels don't have gates where sodium is pumped, chloride goes with it. So most of the chloride is usually on the outside of the cell, since the sodium is too. Phosphates is an abundant, negatively charged ion you'll see inside of the cell. Think about things like ATP. There's so much of that inside of living cells. Each one of those has three phosphates. Makes sense to be a lot of that inside the cell with it. When you talk about regulation of water content, it's pretty much staying the same in your body almost always. You got a young individual that's still growing or somebody's gaining or losing weight, you'll see some changes there, but the body likes to keep it pretty constant. That for different reasons, when you look at water balance, what it's largely about is blood pressure. You have more water in your body, pressure goes up, less of it goes down. And of course, the body likes to keep a constant blood pressure. We've got many regulators of water balance in the body. Our kidneys are number one. Look at urine, it's mostly water by far. So you wanna balance water, kidneys do it for you very rapidly. You take in a large amount of water, kidneys tend to get rid of it very quickly. When you look at the regulation processes being used, osmosis you've heard about as far back in Anatomy 1 courses, the movement of water from high to low concentration. Like many things, water moves from where there's more of it to where there's less of it. Osmolality. You may have heard about this with the hypothalamus and knowing when to regulate the release of hormones like ADH, antidiuretic hormone. The hypothalamus is always monitoring the osmolality of the blood. Osmolality is how many particles in solution. So basically what they are, viscosity receptors. If osmolality is high, blood's too thick. If it's too thick, you need to add some water to it. It's when the hypothalamus tells you you're thirsty. If osmolality is too low, then there's not enough particles in solution because there's too much water in it. Stop releasing hormones like ADH, you'll stop holding water. The kidneys get rid of the excess and balance the osmolality out. Barrel receptors, pressure receptors are found in the body for different reasons, but some of these pressure or stretch receptors are found in places like the aorta and the internal carotid arteries. Whenever blood pressure is high, they detect more stretching of the artery wall. That sends action potentials back to the brain more frequently. And that's how the brain knows blood pressure is high. At that time, you'd want to release water. Just the opposite, if blood pressure is low, you'd want to hold it. Hormones and many things can balance your blood pressure out. And also there's learned behavior. Whenever we say get outside and start sweating and losing a lot of water, sometimes we'll actually even start to drink it before we need it. All that helps to balance things out. When you look at sources of water, almost all of it's ingested through the oral cavity, probably at least 90%. It's a little bit made through cellular metabolism, maybe 10% or so. And again, if you look at how water's lost, urinary systems, number one, 
And of course, there's a certain amount evaporates off our skin when we're hot, helps to cool us off. And the respiratory passages, every time we breathe air in, we add water to it. We want that moist air, that way it doesn't, uh, it's not dry and damage the delicate air passageways. So we add water as the air comes in, we lose it as the air is blown back out. And there's a small amount lost through the digestive system too. Going back to osmolality, again, what the hypothalamus is doing right here is basically measuring how thick your blood is by adding or removing water that helps to keep it at just the right balance. You don't want blood that's too thick. It's harder for the heart to pump that stuff. It's not going to flow as easily as what you'd like. You also don't want blood that's too thin. That means you don't have enough reds, probably not enough oxygen delivery at that time. So keeping the osmolality and the water balance is important to homeostasis. So again, if you've got a high osmolality, too many particles in solution, not enough water. Again, if there's not enough water in your blood, hypothalamus tells you you're thirsty. You'll drink more water to thin it out. In the same time when ADH is released, that tells the kidneys to hold water. That's what you need if there's not enough water in your blood. With lower osmolality, now there's not enough particles in solution because there's too much water in it. Of course, at that time, you wouldn't be thirsty. And ADH tells the kidneys to hold water, and that's exactly what you need at that time. Or excuse me, with decreased osmolality, you need to get rid of it. So you can inhibit the ADH, you'll stop holding water, you'll get rid of it. Getting around the excess water would raise the osmolality back up. Regulation of extracellular fluid volume, again in the carotids, right, at that sinus where that common carotid splits and the aorta, good places to monitor your blood pressure. Monitor the blood going to your brain, because if you don't keep enough blood going there, well, you're in big trouble, you're not going to live long. And monitor pressure in the aorta. So that's the first artery. It goes out every place in the body except the lungs. So that's a good place to monitor pressure there. The juxtaglomerular apparatus found back in the kidneys. Here's where you have renin secretion. Renin regulates aldosterone secretion. Aldosterone tells the kidneys when to hold water. Looking at the right atria of the heart, there's hormones like the A and H. Whenever your blood pressure is high and the right atrial wall is stretched, more A and H is released. Well, that tells the kidneys to release water, just the opposite of the ADH. The blood pressure is high and you release water, that'll help to bring it down. So, of course, looking at all these receptors, the neural receptors in the brain, monitoring how often action potentials are sent back from the barrel receptors. High frequency means blood pressure is high. Low frequency means it's low. And, of course, your brain can do a lot of things to balance your blood pressure out. We've got hormones that regulate blood pressure. ADH is the strongest of them all. Again, diuretics cause you to lose water. Antidiuretic cause you to hold it. Definitely need to hold it if pressure's low. Same with aldosterone. Tells the kidneys to hold water too. But if blood pressure is high, release the ANH. That tells the kidneys to release water. And that'll bring it back down at that time there. So looking back at electrolytes, if you take any of these ions and put them in water, they're called an electrolyte because ions in water conduct electric signals very well. It's one of the reasons the body loves to have plenty of them in it. So that's all these molecules with electric charge, positive or negative. We have to ingest every bit of that stuff. You can't make any of them. You got to eat them. And of course, you'll get rid of the excess through kidneys, liver, skin, and lungs. Changes are not seen much. unless a person's uh, still growing or adding or losing weight. You're not going to see much of any change. It's a constant balance. Again, sodium is the most abundant ion in the body. It's also the most abundant extracellular cation. In other words, outside the cell and positive. And down here at the bottom, you can see that water moves when sodium moves. When the cells want to move water, they pump sodium. Sodium moves, chloride follows it, and water chases them. That's how we get most all of our water movements, what they mean by osmotic pressure. And then again, you look at how we regulate the balance of sodium in the body. Kidneys are number one. Again, we lose some when we sweat. You do not want hyper or hypo, too high or too levels of sodium. It'll disturb things like water balance, action potentials, and membrane potentials on cells like neurons and muscles. It can cause big problems there. So hypernatremia is often caused by eating too much in the diet. A lot of people consume too much sodium. Maybe they were given a hypertonic solution. 
somebody's given something like sodium bicarbonate, they'll separate, they'll dissociate when put in water. Well, the bicarbonate with its negative charge will help to neutralize the hydrogen acidosis, but at the same time, that's putting sodium in the body too. Aldosterone tells the kidneys to hold sodium. If you secrete too much of it, you'd have too much sodium in you. You lose too much water, then that increases the levels of the ions in the body. Hypo, too little. Maybe somebody's not taking enough of it in their diet. Or anytime they go to losing large volumes of water, often the ions are lost with it. You can also dilute these ions out by consuming far too much water. That can actually kill a person there if they drank enough of it. And hyperglycemia tends to add to this too. A lot of people got high blood sugar levels. So there's the links to the books there at the bottom.